gentlemen, the play is the theme with your host, Judy Sleep. Special guest, Peter Hannerkamp, managing partner of the Stephen Tauk House in Amagansett. Now here's Judy, Judy, Judy. Thank you, Stephen. And welcome to the, another episode of Play is the Thing. And I have a wonderful guest, Peter. I'm not going to try to pronounce your second name <laughs> on the camp or something like that. That's it. <laughs> From Stephen Talk House. Now, people may wonder what a Stephen Talk House is because other people will watch this show other than the Hamptons. So, could you explain that name? Well, Stephen Talkhouse was the last king of the Montauk Indians. So he's a very famous local character out here. He was sold for $40 when, as an indentured servant. He served in the American Civil War, and he was a great messenger. So he would take your message, and he would walk from, say, here to Patchogue and deliver it, stay in different people's houses along the way. Um, a very, very famous walker. Um, he was also the last king of the Montauk Indians, and he's buried out in Montauk with all his braves in a circle around him. Um, the guy who had the, the talk house, which is you know a bar in Amagansett before me, came up with the name, and when we took it over in 1987, um, we kept the name because it's an institution um, in, throughout the Hamptons for a lot of people. And uh, how come, how many people know the history of the name of I, the Stephen Talk House? I, I don't know how commonly known that is. I, I couldn't put a number on it. I would say not a lot. Yeah, I would say because I didn't know. I just know that. Yeah, I'd say maybe 10% of East Hampton residents know that. There might be more, but I don't know, obviously. And if somebody would walk into your establishment, would you have the history of the Stephen Talk House somewhere? No. Uh, we've just put his picture up on the wall, but not made a point of the history of it. We could. It's an idea, but it's not one yeah. that crossed my mind. <laughs> but his, his picture's up on the stage, a large photograph of him with his walking stick. And you, I mean, Stephen Tolkhouse is, a, as you said, a bar, but it's also home to a lot of musicians. Yes, we started doing live entertainment in 1987, and it's a very intimate setting with a great sound system. Um, and you can see some of the top performers in the world. Over 50 people in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame have performed at the Stephen Talk House, which is remarkable given the size of the venue. It is. So uh, let me just first find out, where are you from? I was born in Brooklyn but raised in Queens, in Douglas and Queens on the North Shore of Long Island. Uh -huh. And I lived in Manhattan after that for a while, went to school in Manhattan, and came out here around 1980. And when you were in Manhattan, uh, what kind of school did you do? You specialize in anything? I, I'm a big history buff, so I graduated with a history degree from Columbia University and actually went back into their PhD program and was working on my PhD when I decided I didn't want to continue. So, um, but I'm still a very big fan of, of history. You know, me too. I love history. And uh, so after Manhattan, you uh, ventured out to the Hamptons? Well, I worked for, as a newspaper reporter for the New York Post for a while. Really? For three years. And then I became disillusioned with the style of journalism they were practicing oh. um, <laughs> with, uh, uh, when Rupert Murdoch came in. So I came out here to write a great, the great American novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I made a living one. selling ambulances to fire departments, so I could, uh. I was a commissioned salesman, so I could write when I wanted and work when I wanted. Amagansett was one of my first ambulances that I sold, and I fell in love with the, um, the area, so that's how I came to be in Amagansett. The novel, I finished maybe five, six years later, wasn't particularly good, but it was something I needed to do, and when I concluded writing the novel, that's when the opportunity to buy uh, Stephen Talkhouse became Did available. Did you sell the novel? No, I didn't even show it. It wasn't that oh. good. I've written some things that I think are, but that wasn't one of them. Okay, so how did this uh, came about, about uh, buying the Stephen Talkhouse? Um, I was with the writer Clifford Irving, who wrote the uh, 
bogus biography of Howard Hughes. I had to go to jail for it. <laughs> and we were having a few drinks, and I was kind of depressed because I had finished the novel, and I didn't want to stay as an ambulance salesman. And he said, is there anything else you ever wanted to do? And I said, I, yeah, when I was younger, I wanted to buy a bar. He, he, and he pointed at the talk house, and he said, buy that bar. And <laughs> just it, it, like it, that. Just like that. And it, it was a very fortuitous moment in my life because um, I've had a lot of great great times there, and I'm proud of, you know, everything we've been able to do for the So you, you there. purchased it by yourself? But no, I had partners. I had uh, several partners in the beginning. There were, well, in the beginning, there were five of us. There's probably about 25 of us now. A lot of people in town own a piece of the Stephen Talk House. Oh, well, I was wondering how come you had all that cash to buy it. <laughs> so you had some partners. Yeah. That's very interesting. And how do you get along with all these partners? Great. They're all, they're all good people. Um, you know, uh, the bar does well. Um, so my partners let me manage it the way I want to manage so it. You're the man you're there all the time? Uh, in the summer, not in the winter. You don't have to be there all the time in the winter, especially now with emails and everything else. You can, you can be away from your business a lot more than you were able to back so in 1987. So during the winter, you don't, you just open in the evening, would you say? We just uh, open on weekends in the, oh, you know, the, in the off season. And if I'm in town, I'm there. And if I'm not in town, I'm not. But there's, you know, the, the staff is the same staff that's been there. No, the staff hasn't changed in over 10 years. Wow. There are um, several people there from the beginning, 27 years, and there are over 20 people who have been there for more than 15. So that's something I'm very proud of that no, um, we've... It's like a home. Ev everybody knows, uh, every one of the bartenders there is a character in their own right and <laughs> has their own notoriety in, in the town. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's not like most Hampton bars. No, well, how is it different? <laughs> well, I'm not, it's, it's different because of its longevity. It's, di it's different because uh, it's completely unpretentious. Everyone's the same. We don't care, you know, who, ha who, 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 the has, the, who has the most money. We just care ab about treating everyone the same. There's a big mm -hmm. sign when you go in the door that says the employee is always right. <laughs> uh, so we back each other up all the time. Yeah. So if somebody doesn't like, if a doorman doesn't like someone, you're out. If a bartender doesn't like, you're out. There's no appeal to me. They're their own boss. So you have a, like a bar stool there, right? In a the bar. There are bar stools, yeah. Bar stool and the, what do you call it, where you serve? The <coughs> Where you put the drink, the bar stool. You sit yeah. in the bar stool. Yeah, on the bar. On the bar, yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I sat in one of those. <laughs> yeah. And how many stools do you have? Well, you, you get about 130 people into the first room where the music is. Um, oh. And you can, you can get more than that if we take all the, the chairs out, uh, which we do for some of the reggae acts. And then there's an outdoor bar. It's enclosed on the, on the roof, but it's not enclosed on the sides. And uh, that's open in the summer. And then there's a, another outdoor bar that's only open on weekends in the um, Yeah, but in the inside summer. where you have the... Uh, where the music is, yeah. No, not where the music is. That's where you serve the drinks. Is that where, where the, the music, music is? Where the music is, yeah. Oh. Well, for the audience, you have chairs. Yes. But then you have bar stools around the... Uh, yeah, and the bars. And the people bar. can sit at the so bar and watch... how many stools you have there? Oh, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40. Really? You're... Uh, the, the thing is so long? It's a I long bar. It's a long bar. Yeah. Oh. So what about the performance? Who would you, who would you remember the most? It's, it's like comparing blondes and brunettes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have my own personal favorites. Uh, I always love Taj Mahal and Eric Burden, who was lead singer of The Animals. They don't play there much anymore. Uh, Dave Mason, who was in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, who was in Traffic, play, still plays there, and I love his shows. Uh, Toots of the Maytals, it's a reggae show. Uh, Loudon Wainwright III, who's a folk performer. But again, I, I, the, the list could go on and on. I you know, know you like they've some. So, they are different. Uh, it's, yeah. 
So who gets your, uh, who gets the talents? I do. Do you go after them or they come to you? It's a combination. After 27 years, we're known in the industry. Agents know us. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a very good reputation. The artists like playing there. We're not a large venue, so I'm not going to get everybody I'd like to get. Oh, uh, because you have to pay them, uh, right? Yeah, so, and, and if, you know, if I have to pay them a lot of money, then the ticket can reach a point where it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, each year I'll go to the acts that have performed the prior two years that made money, and I'll try to rebook them. And then I'm the agents will always throw you out certain names of acts. And then I try to find out if that, act, that new act will make sense. We have a large email list, so I just send an email out to everyone. Here, here's this new band. They're going to cost this much a, 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 of a ticket price, because I'll know that. And if enough people email back, do it, I do it. If no one emails back, I don't. And when you, how do you get your customers? Kidnap them. Well, the, the, well, you know, a we a lot of people answer. know the club. It's it's very well known, and it's known um, for the the music that's played there. So people look on our website and then yeah, purchase tickets. Mm -hmm. And then for the younger um, people, you know, we do things late at night, and people go there obviously to drink, to to, to meet members of the opposite sex or same sex. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> so you have a younger audience then, and we have bands <laughs> that. Uh, from the area that usually play late on Friday and Saturdays and in the summer straight through the week. And people come because in the summer they make might be a reggae night, it might be an employee's night, it might be a karaoke night, but they go because it's a fun bar and there's lots of other young people there and there's Monday almost never any problems there either, so it's a safe environment. You said Monday you have karaoke night? No, Wednesday in the oh, summer. Wednesday in the yeah. summer. Yeah. That must be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I just, before I came here, I spoke to uh, Pauline Sutcliffe, a friend of mine, on the, and she said I should tell you that her favorite in your show, in your shop was Bob Dylan. Well, he never played there. She told me she had seen him over there. <laughs> no. His son Jacob Dylan played there. Oh. But Bob never played there. Oh, really? We've had some big acts play there. Paul McCartney's played there, and... Billy uh, Joel and Jimmy Buffett, Paul Simon, Sting, and John oh, Bon Jovi. So, wow. but they didn't pay for money; they paid um, for charity. A charity or, or, or yeah, basically yeah. for charity. Because she just said, "Make sure you tell him." Oh, I would I love like. to have Bob Dylan there. Maybe <laughs> she could make a phone call. <laughs> well, you know, she uh, she's promoting her late brother's work, who is. Uh, who was uh, one of the original Beatles, Paul Sutcliffe. I guess you don't know. No, I wasn't yeah. familiar. I didn't know there was a, another. I yeah. knew there was one other Beatle, but I thought um, I didn't know. Well, that was anyway. many years ago, and he made, he did a lot of paintings. So she's, you know, in charge of his estate. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, that was just a. Do you also serve uh, food? No, we don't. Oh, you don't? Just drinks? Just drinks. Well, Drinks and music. <laughs> <laughs> they eat so elsewhere. Where did you get all that food for that party that you had? <laughs> oh, I just went out and bought it. <laughs> oh, you bought it. I, for some reason, I thought that you also served some... Uh, no. So what do you have on, on the bar? You have pretzels, nuts? No. Nothing? No. Nothing. Oh my gosh, no wonder people get, get pretty drunk if they don't eat. <laughs> well, they're supposed to eat beforehand. Before. <laughs> yeah. So what about your partners? Do you have, like, main partners or they're like, equal? You said the right now. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, my former father-in-law and former aunt are two of the main partners. But, uh, you know, my both my son and daughter own shares. Um, and then I have just... V various people in, in the town who bought anywhere from one piece of stock to ten pieces of stock, including four of the people that work there own a one percent of the of the business. I just ran into some financial troubles about ten years ago, and so the way to keep the bar going and keep me going 
was mm -hmm. to really kind of turn it into, I don't know if you're familiar with the Green Bay Packers, but it's a football team, and the town of Green Bay owns them. So I just put out an email. I'm a little trouble. I want to sell some stock. This is what it's worth, and this is what you'll probably get back each year on, on this uh, dividend. You'll always be able to sell it. And I have a list as long as Main Street and East Hampton of people who would like to buy stock. That's, that's very interesting. Obviously, you have a very good business head. <laughs> in, in some things, yes. And who takes care of the buying of the alcohol? Uh, it's one of, one of the guys that works there. I mean, I do it in the winter. He does it in the summer. Do you have every, all sorts of uh, alcohol, like... Uh, yeah, everything. Even There's uh, probably 10 different kinds of beer, and there's tap beer, and there's, you know, all the that main... Is the best seller, the beer? <coughs> um, probably vodka is the best seller. <coughs> and you have also sweet aperitif. It's, it's not really that kind of place. No. <laughs> <laughs> How about well, I don't have a big <laughs> stock of aperitifs. <laughs> and what about wine? Yeah, we have wine. We have Chardonnay, Pinot Grigio, Cabernet, mm. Merlot. Wow. And what else? So you, you like to write. Do you still write stuff? Uh, I'm working right now on a, two screenplays. One's about a serial killer who torments a small Maryland town during a Civil War battle reenactment. And the other one is about... Um, a guy who used to work there, Chris Carney, who runs a gym in East Hampton, Railroad Fitness, and he biked across America in 2004 to raise money and awareness for soldiers who were traumatically injured in Iraq and Afghanistan. The second year, he biked back with a double amputee, Heath Calhoun, mm -hmm. and a single amputee, Ryan Kelly, and we raised close to $15 million on those two rides to help launch an organization called the Wounded Warrior Project, which has now grown into the a hundred and fifty million dollar a year organization that offers a variety of programs to help injured soldiers. So I'm writing the screenplay of how that whole f ride with those guys started because it not only raised money but it revolutionized um, how wounded soldiers are treated in this country. Instead of being relegated to a hospital bed where they're only talking to their spouse or their doctor, they actually were getting on bikes and feeling like vibrant young men and women again biking with other soldiers, backing their fellow soldiers up, and setting the example for the incoming wounded, and going out into the communities they sacrifice so much for. We do a ride in East Hampton, well, in Amagansett, actually, each year. We have about 1,000 people bike behind the soldiers, raise about $200,000. It's amazing. It's amazing. I know somebody by the name of <coughs> Chris, who uh, is very active in this. Yeah. I can't remember his surname. <laughs> Uh-huh. Well, it, it's, it's wonderful how you do all these uh, things to raise money yep. to unfortunate people. That shows that you're a very good guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, give back to them. They gave so much for us. Right. And it's, it's, it's much easier to give <laughs> than receive. And so if it's I much easier <laughs> to give <laughs> than to receive, yeah. yeah. And so uh -huh. we are, we're fortunate at the Talk House that we have a forum where we can help people in the community who have problems, and we're happy to do it. That's great. So what made you start writing? I mean, you said you were a newspaper man for the Post. Well, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've always written. Uh, you know, um, I love American history. I love literature. And so... I, I know... Uh, I was married to a newspaper man, but he was working for the, <coughs> excuse me, the Long Island Press. I remember that. You remember the Long Island Press? Sure, I was a, I'm a Long Island boy. And, uh, well, he had a column there, the travel column. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, but at the Post, you know, Cindy Adams. Mm, I didn't know her. I mean, when I was there, it was like 77 to 80. I don't think she, if she was there then, and she may very well have been. Oh, yeah, she probably didn't. Earl Wilson was there at the time. Uh, yeah, I knew yeah. Um, Murray Kempton, uh, J James Wexler, um, How Clive about Murray Barnes. Brown? Murray Brown. It's not, it's not ringing a bell. Travel but, for yeah. the post. Yeah. 
say I know a little people, <laughs> a few people yeah. in the newspaper business because I was involved. So what are you going to do with all this? Do uh, you have a, an agent, or how are you going to get well, I'm going to finish it. We're also working on a, my, my partner and friend, Nick Krauss, who's been very involved, is working with uh, an, uh, a videographer, Matt Hendrew, and we're actually working on a documentary about that ride, or they are. So um, we'll be pitching both that and my screenplay to just, I know some actors out here who are friends of mine. I can get it looked at. Oh, who you know, actors? Um, Harris Eulin's a good friend of mine. Oh, I know him, and he, his wife was on my show. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, Ed Burns is out here, um, and I'm not necessarily saying any of these people will, will be the ones that uh, yeah. take well, an interest just, in it. I haven't broached it to anyone. We just name drop it. Yes, we <laughs> name drop it. Alec Baldwin was very helpful to us in the early going of Soldier Ride. He did uh, a film clip for us. And he was one of the first people to give us a big check to he help He is so do it. helpful out here. He's yeah. very helpful. But I can't get him on this show. <laughs> I <laughs> spoke to him several times. Well, you got me. I mean, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one time he promised you if he, if he wins like five Emmys, he will come. But nah. I don't think he won last year. <laughs> Which is crazy. Doing I very was well. wooning for him. Oh, give him an Emmy so he will come. <laughs> 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 yes. So uh, you, I, I asked you before. You haven't heard of uh, Anna Cheek, but I will make you ask her to come on your because she's really a wonderful songstress. She writes her own songs and she plays her own music, and she does my theme song. Uh -huh. here. And I believe she told me once that she was at the talk house, but. Do you get some a lot of people from upstate New York? Uh, they come from all over the country. Uh, I don't yeah. know that no, uh, anyone uh, from upstate New York. <laughs> I mean, other than uh, a number of people who who played there from uh, lived in Woodstock, like John Sebastian, I think was mm -hmm. in Woodstock, and Rick Danko and Levon Helm of the band were from Woodstock. Mm -hmm. So we got some musicians there, but mm -hmm. I don't really know where they all live. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I see. I see. So uh, besides the writing, is there anything else? Do you ever act any, any place? I did when I was younger, but not now. What no, I'm, I, I, just community stuff back in the town I grew up in. But, um, you know, between the talk house, uh, the writing I do, and I go, I travel a lot with soldiers on these bike rides, injured soldiers. So mm -hmm. I just did one in England for two weeks with 15 American and 15 British soldiers who suffered traumatic injuries. We just did one up in Boston and Cape Cod, another one on the North Fork of Long Island, uh, obviously uh, the one we did here. And we do one from Miami to Key West in January. So I work on that. And um, I try to raise money for the Wounded Warrior Project um, through a variety of things. We have a big gala at the Waldorf Astoria in late May. I try to sell tickets to that. and. I, I do some uh, work with Sirius Radio. Um, they broadcast uh, some concerts in the talk house, and they have put me on a number of their shows um, to talk about the Wounded Warrior Project, so I've been fortunate to have that from them. Thank you, Scott Greenstein, who <laughs> is the president of Sirius Radios and lives in Amagansett. Before you mention that uh, your son and your daughter are, are partners, what mm -hmm. do they do? Well, my son is a graduate of Fordham University. Where does um, he live? He lives in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and he's going to be going into the working uh, in the bar business. Uh, he wants to ultimately um, open a club in New York. Uh, Very We're ambitious. trying to figure out how to do that. And uh, he's 24. My 22-year-old daughter mm -hmm. is the personal assistant to Carrie Close. If I'm pronouncing it right, she's the Victoria's Secret model. And one of the like top models in the world. Oh my gosh! How did you manage to have such a beautiful I, daughter? I, <laughs> my my daughter is beautiful, but um, she works for a personal assistant for Carrie Close, so that's what she does. And, yeah, and my son has worked at the bar in, in the summers for the last several years, and I love them both. 
Well, that's great, yes. Well, she must be beautiful if she works for Victoria's Secret. <laughs> well, she works for a Victoria's Secret model, but she is beautiful. But yeah. she didn't get the job because of looks is what I'm saying. She got the job because she's, she's good. good at it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, you didn't mention about your marital status, so I'm not going to ask. I'm single. <laughs> I'm single. Are you looking? Uh, not to get married. No. <laughs> no. Um, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, sure, I, I, I adore women. And so I'm always looking, but I don't want to get married again. Yeah, and once get, is enough. Yeah. What was it, more than once? <laughs> um, it was twice. It was twice. But I get along um, with both my exes, so. Well, that's good. That's very good. Unless you want to marry me. You know, I always say I'm available. <laughs> 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 but I don't want to get married either. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could have like a partnership. Great. With our do you mind transferring the money in your account into my account today? Yes, <laughs> I, I would do that if you would transfer your money in my account. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll get along fine. Yeah. Well, you have been delightful guest, and I want to thank you for coming. And uh, today I didn't have my hair done by Lupita. And I want to thank all my underwriters whose names I just can't spit out, but their names are going to come up on the screen there, without whom I cannot do this show. So, once again, thank you. And I'm thank you. Salute you. Salute. <laughs>